Hi, and welcome to Bold Method Live IFR. Tonight, we're going to be talking about low altitude in route charts. We're going to look at four different flights uh, along Victor Airways and Tango routes in low altitude environment. We're going to go through the charts and look at the airports, the altitudes, uh, the fixes, kind of the navigation along them. So tonight, this should be a great opportunity to review uh, how to use a U.S. low altitude chart, an FAA chart, uh, and also to catch up on some of the new items like RNAV routes um, and the minimum operations network. Uh, tonight, we have Colin Cutler as a technical director, and he'll be managing chat. So as we go through the presentation, if you have any questions, throw them out. Uh, don't wait till the end. Uh, throw them out as I'm going, and we'll work them into the show. And tonight, we also have Bose as a sponsor. Uh, Bose makes the A20 headset. Colin and I have five for airplane. We absolutely love it. They also just released the Pro Flight 2. It's designed for turbine aircraft. Um, we've used a previous version on some of our filming trips uh, with, with airlines, uh, and it's an in-ear headset. Uh, a lot of crews like because it's very comfortable and light, uh, designed for uh, jet operations. We've got a link in the description to check out the Bose products. Uh, give them a look after you're done with this, uh, this broadcast. Okay, so uh, tonight we're going to look at four different scenarios. The first scenario is going to be a basic VF or a basic IFR flight along airways. We're going to go out of uh, Portland to Richland. Uh, we're going to look at the clearance, and we're going to work our way along the Victor Airway structure. And we're going to look at the altitudes and the symbology as we move along this chart. The concept here is to help you understand what you're looking at when you look at a low altitude in route chart. The second example is going to go through an RNAV route, a Tango route, and you're going to see uh, how that information is a little bit different. Not much, just a little bit. And then finally, we're going to go from there and look at two uh, in-air scenarios, uh, one of which I received when I flew into uh, John Wayne about a month ago. Uh, we were flying direct, and we were given airway routing as we approached the airport, and another possible scenario coming into Aspen. The interesting thing today, uh, with RNAV-equipped aircraft, uh, many of us are no longer filing Victor Airways. In fact, um, many of you are probably going, yeah, I mean, how often do you really use these anymore? You just need to look at the off-route altitudes and you're kind of good to go. But the reality is, as you start to enter a busy terminal environment, uh, if you're in a piston-powered low-altitude airplane, uh, they typically will not assign a star, though they could, uh, but they very well may, may assign some uh, standard routing via Victor Airways. And so that routing sometimes can be a little bit complex. And if you just haven't looked at those charts for a while, it can be a little bit daunting. So this is a, a good way to get back into it. Okay, uh, we're going to start by taking a look at a route from Portland, Oregon. And we're going to go down to uh, Richland. And Colin's got the clearance. Why don't you bring it up? You want to read it to us? Okay, we'll bring up the clearance here. And it is this. Cirrus 216 Bravo Delta cleared to Richland via Battleground, Victor 448, Yakima, Victor 204, Gussie, direct. Okay, let's take a look at how I put this in. And uh, we're using four flight tonight. Uh, we'll use that all the way through with a U.S. low altitude chart from the FAA. Uh, you can see in the flight plan box that I will leave drop down. I'm starting with KPDX, then BTG is the battleground VOR, Victor 448, then Victor 204. Gussie is the last fix in that clearance, and then uh, to Richland. So let's start. We're going to start by just zooming in here uh, into Portland International. One of the first things that people notice is that Portland has this blue ring with the dashed blue circle on the outside, or the, the blue circle with the dashed blue ring on the outside. That indicates Class C airspace. Class B airspace would have a solid ring. Uh, and if we actually look at Portland itself, you can see a couple things. No special VFR. Um, so no fixed wing part 91 special VFR operations are allowed. Um, the name of the airport, Portland International. PDX is the identifier. The C that you see right here, uh, that means it's a class Charlie airport. The elevation is 31 feet MSL. It is lighted essentially continuously because there is no star. Um, the longest runway is 11,000 feet. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then ATIS can be reached on 128.35, or if you're operating in a military aircraft with UHF radios, 269.9. Uh, with that 11,000 feet, uh, kind of an interesting check ride question, uh, the FAA does not round at 50. They round at 70. So let's say the uh, length of the runway was 10,000 
940 feet, they'd run that down to 10,900. That will go all the way up to, if it's 10,969 feet, it's rounded down to 10,9. It has to be 10,970 feet or longer to round up to 11,000. So it puts a little benefit of the doubt um, on the pilot. If it says that it's 11,000, it's gonna be within 30 feet of 11,000. Okay, uh, a couple other things that you can see here. Um, as we go out, you can see our track. I have removed uh, four flights aeronautical chart. We'll talk about that. Um, it's a great feature, but when we're just trying to show the chart today, it kind of complicates things. So I've removed that and I've removed the route labels so that you can see four flights overlaid route, um, but it's not obscuring the chart, which we're gonna talk about here in depth. Uh, as we come out, you can see the battleground VOR. This is battleground right here. Um, you'll notice a couple things. We'll talk about this data, the minimum crossing altitudes in a second, uh, but just starting at the beginning, the name of the VOR, battleground, uh, 116.6, the frequency, that's your uh, frequency to tune the VOR, um, and it's actually a Vortac, we'll talk about that in a second, but the underline means this facility does not have voice transmission capability. Something to think about, um, many nav aids, whether they're NDBs, or VORs, VOR DMEs, Vortex, uh, have the ability to transmit air traffic control or flight service station voice. You could monitor them and listen for someone broadcasting to you. Uh, and ATC can talk over them. But if it's underlined, they don't have that ability. Okay, um, you'll also notice BTG is its identifier. The 113, it's DME channel 113. You have the Morse code, and then under that, the lat long of the facility. Just looking at it, uh, first of all, we can tell this is a high altitude VOR because the service protection area doesn't show an L or a T um, in that name group. We'll look at a couple of those in a second. And if we go down to the facility itself, right here, you'll notice it's got the kind of black tips on it. That tells us that it is a VORTAC. Um, VORTAC, if you're not familiar with it, is a VOR DME facility co-located co with a TACAN facility. TACAN radios are used for military navigation. Uh, most civilian aircraft would not have a TACAN radio installed, um, but essentially, when we're flying, you can look at a TACAN and a VOR DME as the exact same thing, or a VORTAC and a, D a VOR DME as the exact same thing. You'll also notice, if we go to the top, um, we have this box, which corresponds to the X flag, uh, and those are minimum crossing altitudes. So let's walk through them. I'm gonna clear this for a second. We know that we'll be joining Victor 448. So when you look at a minimum crossing altitude, you're gonna look for altitudes that apply to your airway or route section. And you can see we have one, Victor 448, 9,400 feet northeast bound. Okay, and if you look at our flight plan, that matches up. We're going direct to the Vortac, uh, we'll probably be climbing to our assigned altitude, but then we would need to cross that battleground vortex at 9,400 feet to safely climb along Victor 448 northeast bound. And if you look at Victor 448, you'll notice we have several fixes. You can see the minimum in route altitude shown right here. There's actually two. If you're going right, or if you're going northeast, it's 14,500 feet. If you're going southwest, it's 10,500 feet with an 8,000 foot minimum obstruction clearance altitude. So what does that mean? Uh, this is something that kind of confuses people. A minimum in route altitude, right? A minimum in route IFR altitude provides two things, navigation signal reception along an airway and obstruction clearance and the obstruction clearance is 1,000 feet in non-mountainous areas, 2,000 feet in mountainous areas, along the width of the airway. And airways are four nautical miles wide, each side of center line. Okay, so why would you have two different MEAs on a single route segment, right? Because they all have the same obstructions, they're all the same width, you're just going different directions. The key thing is that you don't start your climb to the next MEA until you cross the fix where it begins. Okay, so in this case, if you were lost calm and you needed to climb to the next higher MEA and you couldn't reach ATC anymore, they had no more altitude instructions for you, once you crossed battleground, you would need to both cross 
at minimum crossing altitude of 9,400 feet, and then you would need to continue climbing from 9,400 feet up to 14.5. Here's a key thing. They're expecting you to climb at 200 feet for nau per nautical mile. So they know that when you cross battleground and you start going northeast bound, you're not going to be at 14.5 yet necessarily. You're climbing still. But as long as you meet the minimum crossing altitude, 9,400 feet, you climb at 200 feet per nautical mile to the new minimum in route altitude of 14,500 feet, you'll maintain obstacle clearance as you climb, al climb along that route segment. You'll reach 14,500 14, feet before the obstacles get too close to you. If you're going the other direction, you're going away from the obstacles. And so in that case, ATC was allowed, you could use a lower minimum in route altitude because there's nothing ahead of you along that segment that they would need you to avoid. Okay, looks like we got our first question. Okay, first question comes from Jeff and he wants to know, why are some of the distances in a D and others are not on the Victor Airway, Victor 448 that you were just looking at? Okay, so let's start by just looking at that entire first segment. And um, there's several different distances that you're going to see on a chart. First of all, you're gonna have segment distances. I'm gonna make this uh, a little bit brighter. And let's see. Segment distances are gonna give you a distance between different fixes on the route. And so if you look at these distances here, you'll see we have a 10, we have another 10, we have an 18. Each of those are segment distances here, here, and here. They're telling you the distance between each of the fix or the nav aid and the fix groups. However, some of those uh, are also going to be a DME distance. So if you look at this one right here, um, you'll notice this 10 is followed by that little hollow arrow, right? You can see that right there. That means that DIMSA, this fix right here, has been certified at 10 DME from Battleground. Okay, so when we talk about DME certified distances, the problem is you either may not be able to receive the DME radio, the slant range error may be too great to accurately measure the distance. So each of these fixes are flight tested. And then the flight test aircraft certifies that your DME system at or above the MEA can both receive DME and it will accurately identify that fix irregardless of slant range. Now with GPS, we don't have to worry about slant range. And even though those positions aren't gonna be exactly the same, they're close, but essentially to identify a fix with DME, you would need to make sure it has a hollow arrow and a distance pointing to it. This first one just has a hollow arrow and the distance is on its own. And that's because the segment distance is the exact same as the DME distance. But as we start to move down the route, that changes. The segment distance between Dimza and Ojumu is only 10, but Ojumu has been tested at 20 DME and that's 20 DME from battleground. So when you see a circle or a D with a hollow arrow and a number, what that's telling you is that is a DME certified distance, okay? If you just see a hollow arrow next to a number, especially the first segment after a nav aid, that's telling you the segment distance can be used as your DME distance. Okay, looks like we got another question. Okay, next up, and not so much a question, but just a good comment here from Don. And he says, you don't have to cross the BTG, uh, cross BTG at the minimum crossing altitude, but at least that high, you can also be higher. That's right, Don, no, exactly. And so you're right, it's the minimum crossing altitude. It's not a mandatory altitude. And ideally, you, you would obviously want to be higher than that as you continue your climb on out. Um, so as we go out, you can see the next fix that we've got here. Um, I'm gonna clear this. You can see at learn, we've got this little set of T handles. You see the little black T handles on either side of the fix. There's two things that we can, you know, there's, there's, what that tells us is that that is an MEA or MOCA break. And so this 14,500 foot MEA north eastbound applies to the entire segment of route up to learn. At learn, we're going to get a new set of minimum altitudes. And the 38 and the D means that it is 38 DME from battleground. So as we go from learn, you can see 
Now we've got our new segment. The segment's 27 nautical miles long, and we've got our new MEA, 14,500 foot in either direction. Again, these are MSL altitudes, okay? Uh, you also can see a box with a 102 to battleground. When you see a distance in a square rectangle, that's giving you the distance either between compulsory reporting points or nav aids and compulsory reporting points. So what it's really saying is the entire distance uh, from Yakima to battleground is 102 nautical miles. Uh, the advantage is if you're flying the entire segment and you're planning for a leg length, you don't have to add up all the little segment distances. You can just look for the distance in a box. Okay, let me clear this out. Sorry. As we move past Angu, you can see we end up with another set of brackets on that fix. That means our altitudes, our minimum altitudes are changing again. Uh, we're headed northeast bound. So we have two numbers here. We have 8,500 feet. That's our minimum in route altitude and 7,500 feet preceded by an asterisk. That is our minimum obstruction clearance altitude or a MOCA. So um, MOCAs are actually incredibly useful when we're dealing with GPS, but they're also very useful when we're working with VOR. What a MOCA does is it says the entire route segment that, that the MOCA applies to, uh, that altitude will guarantee you the same required obstruction clearance. So 1,000 feet in non-mountainous or 2,000 feet in mountainous. So it gives you obstruction clearance. And within 22 nautical miles or 25 statute miles of the nav aid, it will also give you navigation signal reception. So you can safely fly at the MOCA, as soon as you fly past the fix where that MOCA starts, you may not be able to reach the VHF or, or pick up the VHF nav aid, but if you're RNAV equipped, you could suitably use RNAV at that altitude to navigate the route. In a lost comm scenario, the way you could look at it is the MEA would apply until you are 22 nautical miles away from the, the nav aid, and then if you, if you needed to go down to the MOCA, that could apply at that point in time too. Um, but the key thing is if you were filing an altitude along a route and you wanted to get lower than the MEA, maybe you're trying to stay out of ice or clouds or who knows what, um, and you're RNAV equipped, you can safely fly along at the MOCA through, for the entire route segment. You just may not have VHF navigation reception. And also keep in mind, MEAs and MOCAs never guarantee on traditional VHF airways, they never guarantee ATC communication. Just Navigation, if it's an MEA, uh, and obstruction clearance. Okay, looks like we got another question. Next question is from Herring. He wants to know, what is the required climb gradient past the T's at the fixes when you're climbing to a new higher altitude? 200 feet per nautical mile. That's a standard climb gradient required in IFR. That's a climb gradient that you're going to use um, when you are departing in an airport, it's a climb gradient that you would use um, on a missed approach procedure unless it's otherwise published. Same climb gradient that you would be expected on an airway. If for some reason you can't meet that and you see an MAA change coming up ahead of you and you know you need distance to make that climb, you need to coordinate with ATC ahead of time to get yourself up. You'll find oftentimes ATC is very proactive. They tend to climb you early. They don't like you leaving, leaving you low as you approach a higher MEI. But if you're kind of towards the limit of your aircraft service ceiling and you know that 200 foot per nautical mile climb gradient is not going to work out anymore, you need to take responsibility to talk to ATC and initiate that climb early uh, so that you essentially can make up for your lack of performance there. Okay, um, as we head past... Oxnus, you can see, I'm going to clear this again. Um, Oxnus has another 25D in a box. This time it's pointing the other direction. Uh, that means the information is now coming from the Yakima VOR, so the distance information will be measured from Yakima. And as we move in, um, you can see our altitudes change again. The MEA drops down to 6,300 feet as we cross Simcoe here. And then as we come all the way in, it drops down even more. Um, and so you'll also notice that Yakima itself is a solid black symbol. Okay, so what that's telling us is that Yakima is a compulsory reporting point. 
As long as we're in ATC communication and they have not requested that we report it, we don't have to. But if for some reason we could not communicate with, or it, um, sorry, I said that wrong. If, as long as we're in radar coverage and ATC has not requested that we report Ac ACMA, we don't have to. But if we are not in radar coverage, if ATC says radar contact lost, then we would need to report crossing Yakima. Um, or if ATC asks us to report crossing Yakima, we would need to do that as well. It's a compulsory reporting point. Okay, a uh, couple notes as we cross Yakima. You can see um, if we go down to the box, uh, we have a couple minimum crossing altitudes that we'll look at. Um, we have the name. 116.0 for the frequency, again, no voice capability. Um, the identifier, YCAM, the DME channel, 107. Uh, one, a lot of people ask about that. Why do they publish DME channels? Um, DME uh, radios are co-tuned or co-paired with VHF nav frequencies. So on most modern DME units, um, and when I mean modern, I mean like DME units even go back to the 70s. Um, when you select a nav radio frequency, or a VOR frequency, the DME unit automatically tunes to the correct channel. However, if you've got a very old DME unit, which would be hard to find these days, but, but you might, uh, you may have to manually select the DME channel. And so, for example, uh, the frequency 116.0 is always paired with DME channel 107. But if you have to manually tune your DME radio's channel, you would dial in 107. Um, the MCAs on this route segment, we're going to be joining Victor 204 uh, headed southeast bound. And so what you can see is the only um, minimum crossing altitudes that would apply here are for Victor 448 southwest and Victor 204 uh, westbound. So since we're going eastbound, neither of those minimum crossing altitudes apply to us. From there, one of the questions we get um, a lot, I'm going to clear this again. Give me one second. 087, these are always radials. They're not magnetic courses. And so keep in mind, they're going to match the declination of the station or essentially the magnetic north that Yakima is calibrated to. They're not going to necessarily match magnetic north if you were to measure off the isogonic line. But if you were to manually plot using that compass rose, that compass rose is calibrated to the declination. So you would always end up with that same radial, radial 087. Um, there's a little note there that is, I'm going to clear this again, a little unusual. Warning, Victor 204 is three nautical miles wide, north of airway from Yakima to Paps. And Paps is right here. Okay, so why is that? Well, if you were to measure the distance from a protected buffer on this restricted area, you'd find that would be the reason the airway is only three nautical miles wide. It's a fact that restricted area 67, or yeah, 6714 Charlie or 6714 Bravo, those are approaching on the airway. So essentially, as opposed to being four nautical miles wide, it's only three nautical miles wide on that segment. What does that mean for a pilot? It means that you should be keeping the needle centered which we should be doing all of the time. Uh, but you definitely would not want to be off course going on that airway. Okay, next question. And you'll have to give me just a second here. I kind of fat fingered it. So give me just one second. I'll have this question up. Yeah, no problem. Okay, here we go. Uh, this comes from Flight Cal. And what we're doing here is we're going back to the departure part of this uh, flight out of Portland uh, to the VOR. And his question is this, given the MCA of 9,400 at the BTG VOR and the elevation of Portland being 31 feet, will you need to climb in the hold at BTG because it's about 10 minutes north of PDX? Great question. Uh, if you're departing Portland, there's a couple things that are going to happen there. Um, climbing in the holding pattern uh, could be one option. That fix has a published holding pattern, so that would be available to you. Uh, you would need to request that from ATC. Um, 
If the fix didn't have a published holding pattern, you could always request a climb and hold uh, if you needed to to make the minimum crossing altitude. That would be acceptable. If you're lost calm, ATC would expect you um, if you needed to to climb and hold. Um, but but the other options you're going to have coming out of Portland, uh, typically you're going to receive a departure procedure as a um, even a piston aircraft, whether it's a radar departure procedure or whether it's a um, you know, a chartered departure procedure, and hopefully that would give you the distance to climb or vector you on to a point um, where you were able to make it up to altitude. But really good point. Uh, if it doesn't and you reach that point, uh, climb and hold would be your option. You definitely would not want to proceed any further than battleground. And again, if you're an ATC contact, you're going to want to let them know that you need a climb and hold to make altitude. Okay, next question. Next up, another one from Flight Kellen. He wants to know, do the DME distances account for slant error? So essentially, yes. Um, by accounting for slant error, what they're meaning is slant error is negligible, and so therefore not a factor. Um, it is a small factor, but the distance of that fix is going to be so close that essentially it's not an issue. So you would not need to consider slant error and work that into the equation. Uh, something to think about. Because DME uses slant range and RNAV doesn't, it measures horizontal distance. When you're using DME to identify a fix versus RNAV, the fix will be in a slightly different place. Um, but the reality is this. We always think of our navigation systems as exact. And when you go back to VHF navigation, there's a decent amount of tolerance there. And I'm not saying a half mile, but you'll notice uh, if you looked at flight tracks when aircraft were just operating on VORs and VHF radios, Airplanes are all in all different positions. Now that we've switched to WAS-enabled RNAV, everybody is basically at the exact same point. And it's a unique and new part of the national airspace system. Um, you know, if you were to look at a, a VOR Victor airway, uh, everybody could show on center and they still could be a little bit off to either one of the sides. Um, and now things are very, very exact. But the answer is, Slant range, slant range is negligible, and when you see a DME certified distance, you can just read it straight off your DME unit. Okay, um, another question? We do have another question, and I didn't forget to turn the light off. No, uh, actually, we have a whole bunch from here, uh, but we'll start, we'll start off with this. Gesturehead wants to know, just out of curiosity, how does the FAA define mountainous terrain? Is it shaded or depicted on the chart, or is it just baked into the altitudes on the charts in those areas? Okay, it's baked into the altitudes for both the MEAs and the off-route obstacle clearance altitudes. We'll talk about that in just a quick second. Um, they define uh, mountainous areas as a FAR. I, I'm not going to remember the FAR, but it's in the airspace FAR. So I think it's part 93. Um, I'll, have I'll to try look, to, I'll we'll, try we'll to look it up here and post it in the comments. There's a FAR that actually defines uh, mountainous airspace. Um, However, in the AIM, they kind of publish an example, um, and you can actually look at the lat longs, uh, but in the AIM, they, they publish kind of a picture, and they show you where it is, and I believe it or not, um, I can show you kind of the east border. There's for the Rocky Mountain segment. Uh, there's also mountainous areas in the east, but essentially almost everything west of this border here um, is mountainous, and then there's sections in the southeast as well. They're defined by FARs. They are not shown on the chart. However, if you look at the off-route obstruction clearance altitude, so let's start with this one here. Um, you're going to see a grid, and this grid, oh, let me do that again, is bounded by these lat long lines right here. Okay, that's your grid. And then you're going to notice inside that grid is a number in brown, 7,600 feet. That is your off-route obstruction clearance altitude. Or you could look at it as your minimum in-route altitude inside that specific block. Uh, and what that means is it's actually going to take a four nautical mile buffer around the block. Because remember, if you drew an airway coming right down this block, it's going to be about four nautical miles wide. So it takes a basically a four nautical mile buffer around that quadrant, finds the highest obstacle, rounds up to the next 100 feet, and then applies either appropriate mountainous or non-mountainous obstruction clearance. That altitude now could be used um, as a RNAV MEA. 
it would not guarantee any navigation reception. Um, so one of the questions we'll hear every once in a while is someone will see an MEA along an airway that is higher than the Oroca um, in that grid. And it's higher because they're forecasting a climb uh, to meet obstructions further down the airway segment. So keep in mind that airways aren't always subdivided as they go segment. You know, it, in each Oroca, you could have a segment that spans multiple grids and so forth. So therefore, you could see an Oroca that's fairly low and an MEA along an airway that's higher. The airway could either require the MEA for higher, uh, higher altitude for nav reception or an obstacle further down that segment um, or down that airway that requires a climb. So, but yep, those Orocas, if you're not sure where the mountainous area is beginning end and you're planning off-route navigation, the Orocas make a great way uh, to figure out what your minimum in-route altitude would be. Okay, um, let's take a look here as we move in. Um, the symbology is fairly simple. There's a couple things that I wanted to bring up that people don't always notice. First of all, uh, you'll see one of them here at Mark. Mark is 25 DME. Um, and that DME would be coming from Yakima. Um, but then the other thing you'll notice is that this intersection is actually defined by a radial. It's the 193 radial from MWH. Uh, MWH is 115.0. Uh, they've also put the DME channel in there. Uh, and so mark is a fix that you could rec uh, recognize both by DME, 25 miles from Yakima, or by crossing the 193 radial. Uh, and there's a couple reasons you might do that. If you don't have DME reception, you're not DME equipped. If you're flying an RNAV aircraft and RNAV is unavailable, you could use that crossing radial from MWH to identify the mark fix. Um, from there, the other items we wanted to go through. Uh, at Richland, one of the things that we see here is this MON in a box, MON, that means, that means minimum operational network. Uh, the minimum operational network is essentially the FAA backup network in case RNAV fails. And what it means is that Richland is an airport that could transition you uh, from the in-route structure down to the airport to safely land on an approach using other than RNAV navigation means. So VORs, ILS localizers, that's what they have. So when you see MON, it's essentially a backup airport, not a backup airport, but an airport that is kept operational um, so that, or that the nav aids are kept operational so that if you were to have an RNAV network failure, you could get the aircraft on the ground using purely VHF navigation. It does not mean that you need to go to that airport if you have an RNAV failure. ATC may be able to vector you on to a different approach. It just simply means that the nav aids at that field are maintained to always be available if there was an RNAV failure. Okay, looks like we got another question. Okay, next question is this. Is the boxed altitude 7.6, is that the height MSL of the highest in-box obstacle or the elevation minimum adjusted altitude, like for instance, 1,000 feet uh, above adjusted? Good question. Unlike a VFR sectional, a VFR sectional is the altitude is the obstacle rounded up to the next hundred. The IFR value, the minimum off-route clearance altitude uh, or AROCA, is they add the obstacle, uh, the terrain protection on. So they add a thousand or add two thousand. So the altitude that you see there includes the legally required obstacle protection you would need to stay clear of any obstacle in that grid or within four nautical miles bounding that grid. Because again, you need to stay 1,000 feet above the highest obstacle within four nautical miles, or 2,000 in non-mountainous areas, or in mountainous areas. Okay, um, from there, uh, let's take a look. A um, Couple other things that I get some questions on every once in a while, you'll notice um, on Richland, the airport's got pilot controlled lighting. Um, it has an AOS-3 part-time operation. Uh, so they're listening for transmissions. So essentially, if you flip open and you don't hear anything on AWOS, it's going to need you to transmit. Um, and transmit on uh, CTAF typically will pick up the AWOS and it'll start reporting. Uh, if you see PT, that means part-time. Uh, and typically, transmitting on CTAF will pick up the AWOS and then you can pick up weather. Um, and that's really about it for that route. It's a very, very standard route. Um, so from here, 
let's take a look at an RNAV route that you could get. Uh, we'll do that on our way into Billings. Colin, you have that clearance? I do. Uh, I just pulled it up on the screen and I'll read it off here. And the clearance is this. Cirrus 216 Bravo Delta cleared to Billings via Vipuck Tango 331 Billings Direct. Okay, so let's take a look at this. The only thing that really is unique about this is the fact that we're navigating a Tango route. If you've never seen a Tango route before, they're a blue route published on the low altitude airway uh, sections. It is a RNAV equipped route meant to be navigated by GPS. And so there are a few little differences. Uh, it may co-locate along Victor Airways at times. You can find it uh, using the same tracks. Um, it may be made up of both named fixes that are standard Navade fixes um, with cross radials or DME identifiers, or it may simply be made up of waypoints. So you can see here, in this case, we're going to go direct from Pocatello to Vipuk. There's Vipuk. We're going to follow our Tango route. Tango 331, it crosses over Idaho Falls, and from there, it kind of diverges, it heads off to the northeast, and then we move along a section that could really only be navigated with RNAV. Um, the numbers that you see are the magnetic courses along the route. It's important to keep in mind that if you're navigating this route with your RNAV system, those numbers may be different on your screen, usually only by a degree or two. And that's simply because the isogonic, current isogonic values, which your RNAV system is using, may be slightly different because they're constantly changing from the isogonic values that were used when that airway was charted. So, for example, if it's moved two degrees, it's probably because the variation has moved two degrees in the isogonic tables. And so now your GPS is going to display a slightly different number. But keep in mind, your GPS isn't actually flying a course. It's tracking between each of the different fixes and waypoints using their latitude and longitude along the airway. So even if the number is a degree or two off, as long as you're going between the two fixes, you're going to be covering the exact same line across the ground. Okay, a couple other things that people see here. Um, the 7700G. Really, you can think of G for GPS. This is an MEA, okay? So it's going to provide the 1,000-foot in non-mountainous areas or 2,000 foot of obstacle protection in, non in mountainous areas. Um, but because it does not need to consider nav aid reception from ground-based nav aids, um, you don't have any of the, the elevated MEA that you would get there. So essentially, it's just looking at, um, at terrain clearance. The other thing it actually does provide, um, which nothing else provides on a Tango route, is it provides communication reception. So it does look at your ability to communicate with ATC. So that's the only number that you will find on a sectional or on a low altitude chart that guarantees comm reception. Your standard MEAs, your standard um, MOCAs do not guarantee comm reception. You oftentimes get them, but not always. But on a RNAV T route MEA, a G altitude, it's also been tested for communications reception. It may not be always strong, but it's been tested for it. Uh, the other things that are kind of important to note here, um, you can see here we're tracking between some basic fixes, but then as we break away from uh, Sabat, you'll notice we switch to these kind of star-like symbols. So these star symbols are just um, waypoints. They're not fixes that are made up with DME distances or cross radials. They're simply lat-long waypoints that you would be able to pull up in your database. Uh, and you can see from there, it really looks like the exact same thing. Um, there's no mochas because the GPS altitude takes care of it. Uh, one final thing, this would not apply to operations on the Tango route, but this R, that does apply if you're on the Victor Airway. And the R is a minimum reception altitude. And essentially what it's doing is it's telling you that, that you would need to be at that altitude to identify the fix either by cross radial or possibly by DME. Um, and in this case, it would be a cross radial. You can see the MRA is published. Now I'm going to lose it. Where is it here? Right here. Over on the right. Yep, save at Victor 298. Um, the minimum crossing altitude is 11,100 feet if you're traveling eastbound. The minimum reception altitude if you're using ground-based nav aids to receive that is 10,000 feet.
Um, so if you were not RNAV equipped and you needed to identify that, that fix, you would need to request an altitude at or above 10,000 feet MSL uh, to pick up the cross radial and identify that fix. A couple other things as we get into billings. Um, one of the questions we oftentimes get is billings appears in blue. Other instrument approach airports appear in green. Brown airports do not have an instrument approach procedure. So for example, Bighorn County right here does not have an instrument approach procedure because it's brown. But Billings and Blue and Laurel Municipal right here in green, these do have instrument approach procedures. What's the difference between blue and green? Uh, blue basically means that the airport will have uh, an approach entry in the Department of Defense high altitude flight information publication. Green means that it will have an instrument approach um, in both in TERPS and the low altitude uh, flight information publication. So what we're really looking at um, as civilian pilots, what it really means is blue or green, they both mean that there's an instrument approach there. Military pilots, blue means not only is there an approach there, but they also have high altitude approaches. And I can actually pull that up. If we look at billings, go into the procedures and the approach, you notice they have uh, two different high procedures. They have a high ILS and a high VOR. And if you actually look at this, the concept uh, of a high ILS or a high VOR is it allows you to transition out of the high altitude structure and down to the actual procedure itself. So you can see on the profile view, in this case, um, we actually start at Cooley at flight level 200, 20,000 feet, uh, and then we go down from Cooley to Hotat, where we need to be at or above 6,300 feet, and then minimum altitude 5,300 and 4,300. If you look at this section, you'll realize um, you've got to descend very, very quickly. Uh, and these are procedures you typically would not use in a civilian aircraft. You typically would not use that level of a descent gradient. Okay, looks like we got another question. Okay, next up, the question is this. What VOR backup method do you guys use for situational awareness in case you lose GPS signal? Okay, so that's a really good question. Um, first of all, uh, we typically, we're WAS equipped uh, and, and though you know we have two GPS receivers, it all goes into the same screen, um, that we believe that you know, not only is WAS certified for single source navigation under Part 91, it's safe. We typically fly um, RNAV direct and then we'll slightly adjust to cross over a nav aid. However, while we're in route, we're typically looking at each of the nav aids around our course and we have the VHF navigation radios tuned to them. So let's just take a good example. I'm gonna put in a new route. Um, let's go from um, And I'm just picking an, uh, Moab would be a good one. Okay. So this would be a route I typically would have no issue flying. Um, we've got Rocky Mountain Metro, Rockies for departure, red table transition, uh, and then direct from there to Canyonlands or Moab. And you'll notice uh, we filed the departure procedure uh, because typically ATC is going to assign that to us. Uh, so even if we don't fly it or file it, they're gonna give it to us in clearance. Um, that uses VHF routing all the way through to Red Table right here. From Red Table, I'm going to fly direct to Moab Canyonlands. Some people would say, hey, shouldn't we dogleg and follow that? Um, my approach would be this. I'm going to leave Red Table tuned and I'm going to, you know, just follow that. I'm not going to follow the track, but just monitor the facility. Uh, and then I'm also going to tune in Grand Junction JNC. I'm not going to track to it. I'm just going to monitor the facility. So I typically have them both up on my bearing pointers. And as long as I have no RNAV loss or degradation of service, I don't need to use them. If I was to have RNAV loss or degradation of service 
First of all, I'm typically in air traffic control, both radar and comm contact, so I'm gonna let them know right away that my RNAV system is out. I'm gonna let them know that I either need vectors or I need to track VHF. And so the first thing that I'm gonna typically do is, is ask if I can get vectors. Um, if I'm close, they'll just vector me in. Uh, if I'm not close, then I'll give them an alternate means of routing that I want. And so uh, in this case, I would probably just say, hey, I wanna go direct Grand Junction. Uh, and then if you go back, you could see, I'd, I'd say, you know, if I lost it right here, um, right at that fix, if I lost RNAV there, I'd ask for direct Grand Junction. And then from there, I would take um, Victor 8 to Canyonlands. And there are several different fixes. I think Arch is one of them where you can transition from the Victor Airway and onto the approach here at Canyonlands. Um, so that would be that would be one of the things. The other thing you could do uh, is then from Arch go direct to the Moab VOR. Uh, we get this question a lot. What does that T mean and why is it not on the airway? This is a terminal VOR, typically would not be used as part of a low altitude airway. Um, it has reduced service volume, but you could easily get from Arch to Moab and from there join an approach. So. When you ask the question, um, what do we do to back up our system? We don't hesitate to fly long RNAV routes. What we do is we just simply tune VHF navigation facilities around us. We're always monitoring our position in, re in relation to those VHF navigation facilities. And if we had RNAV loss of service, I'm either gonna ask ATC for a vector, especially if I feel like it's gonna come back quickly, or I can ask them for direct to one of those facilities and then I'm gonna reroute. Um, Okay, we're out in this area. Let's actually talk about that. Rerouting uh, is something that we get a lot. When we talk about low altitude airway structure, um, again, I rarely file it, but I'm issued it quite often. And it's typically when I'm arriving into a busy terminal area. Uh, if I'm going into SNA, Orange County in California, that's a great example. Uh, we're too slow as a piston to be on a standard terminal arrival procedure. They don't have any that they wanna use with us, but they do have standardized routing that help us flow into the airport. So I've got an example here, um, and let's just start with uh, where we were coming from. So we were coming from, um, I'm gonna clear this out. Essentially a route that looked just like this. And as we came over Daggett, um, we were going into John Wayne here, KSNA, and as we came over Daggett, uh, ATC asked, Cirrus 216 Bravo Delta, I have a new route clearance for you, advise when you're ready to copy. Keep in mind, when they say that, it is not that you need to copy the route immediately, so take your time, get your pen and paper out. I like to use the iPad and the pencil to write, test to make sure that the pencil is still paired with the iPad, so as you start writing, you can actually copy down the clearance. I've made that mistake a few times. Take your time, make sure you're ready to go, and then I'll typically come back and say, yep, 216 Bravo Delta, okay, I'm ready to copy. Colin, you've got the clearance. I have that fun clearance right here, and it is this. Cirrus 216 Bravo Delta, clear to Orange County via direct apples, Victor 442, Paradise, radial 270 to Victor 363, Victor 8, Seal Beach, direct. Okay, so take a second, actually, stay on that screen. I'll put it you back up there. You can see it there on the bottom, um, and I'm gonna load in essentially that route, but it's direct apples, join Victor 442, paradise, radial 270, Victor 363, Victor 8, Seal Beach, direct. Okay, so again, this is one of those scenarios where I just got a whole bunch of Victor, a, uh, Victor Airways and I got a radial. Um, so I'm gonna depart a VOR on an actual radial and track that out to go join another airway. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys fly airplanes with glass cockpits, but I can tell you I have only one CDI. There is one thing that I miss about flying a traditional steam-gauged airplane is that I always had two CDIs, which makes it very easy to track out on one and watch another CDI intercept. I do have bearing pointers. Um, they take a little practice to use. They work perfectly, um, but it's a little bit more complex. And so the first thing I'm sitting there going is, okay, what's this clearance? So if you were to try to type that directly into ForeFlight, you're gonna get something that looks like this. 
and we'll zoom in here. You can see Apple's right here. It's going to track me along Victor 442. Okay, from there to Paradise. This is Paradise right here. From Paradise, they said uh, radial 270. There's no way to enter a radial into Foreflight. And so um, Foreflight can't plot that. You're going to have to find it yourself. Uh, from there, you can see, you know, you could identify radial 270, try to trace the Foreflight route. And this shows you exactly what ATC wants. Uh, it brings up a couple things. Number one, when I fly, I typically have the aeronautical chart on in Foreflight. And when you're looking at a region, especially a busy region, and you have the aeronautical chart up, it is really easy to lose track of where all of the airways are. So when I'm given a clearance through a busy set of airspace and I need to be able to identify fixes and, and uh, airways and, and you know radials off of a device, I'm typically going to jump in and turn the aeronautical section off. Um, I will oftentimes, if I'm IFR, turn off the TFRs too, just to clean up the map. Uh, because if I'm IFR, as long as I'm on my cleared route, I'm good to go. So remember what they said was apples, Victor 442 to paradise. And one of the things that I found, then they gave me radial 270. I have found that typically when air traffic control gives you a radial, that radial is published on the chart. So in this case, you can actually see the fix, Arndell, right here is identified by the 270 degree radial from Paradise. So essentially what they're doing is they're saying, go, on, go from Paradise to Arndell. From there, Victor's 363, intercept Victor 8, take that to Seal Beach, and then from there, direct to John Wayne County. So when you're given a complicated clearance like that, um, and you're in a complicated area, especially if ATC gives you something like from this view R, track out on this radial, then from this radial, then to this radial. Uh, take the time, declutter the map, look at the actual chart itself, see if that radial is published. Oftentimes it is, uh, and that can help make navigation easier, especially in RNAV equipped aircraft, you have to fix. But at the end of the day, if you're having a hard time and you feel like, okay, I've only got one CDI plus the bearing pointers, I feel uncomfortable with this. The other thing I always tell pilots you can do, especially if you ask ATC early enough, is you can ask for a fix to fly to as opposed to the radial. Oftentimes, there is a fix that that radial will take you, take you to, even if it isn't charted. By giving you a radial, they're giving you a clearance that will work for both an RNAV and a non-RNAV equipped aircraft. It works for everybody. But if you're to say, hey, okay, I'm looking at this, what should I do? Uh, you can oftentimes, at, or you can ask for a fix and oftentimes they can give it to you. And if not, you should always be proficient if you're flying an HSI equipped airplane where you only have one CDI and everything is bearing pointers other than that, you should be very proficient at using a bearing pointer to intercept an airway and then turn and track that bearing pointer at least long enough to get your HSI reconfigured uh, for the next airway. Okay, that's all the time we got tonight. We're gonna cover more of this in depth uh, as we go on, but uh, if you have any questions or suggestions or ideas from tonight's show, uh, let us know. There is a link down below in the comment section. Uh, and also, uh, check out Bose. We love our A20s. I've heard great things about the new ProFlight headset. Uh, it's a fantastic company uh, for us to work with. We really enjoyed it, but even better, I really do like using their headsets. Okay, uh, we will be back in two weeks with our next Build Method Live, VFR and IFR. I hope to see you then. Good night.